Welcome to today's video. Now, just before we get down to some interesting things that are brought uh, from the literature today and from the news today, I want to give you the weather forecast in uh, Dutch from the Netherlands. And the good news is it looks like a nice day. But of course, the reason I'm showing you this is not only did they give a, an ultraviolet index, a, a UV index telling you how strong the sun is, they also have the good taste to mention that you'll produce vitamin D. And this is the only country in the world that's doing this, but I thought it was just excellent health education. So let's just play that clip now and read the subtitles along the bottom. Want inwaarts kan het 30, misschien plaatselijk 31 graden worden in het zuidoosten van het land. UV-kracht 7, dus binnen 10 minuten een kwartiertje kun je al verbranden. Dus eerst een 10 minuten onbeschermde zon in. Dat kan voor de vitamine D-aanmaak. Maar daarna toch echt wel bescherming zoeken. Of de schaduw in ieder geval opzoeken. Verder ook weinig wind. So I thought that was uh, excellent because not only have you got the information about the risk of sunburn, you've also got the information that the first 10 minutes will make vitamin D. And I'm reminded from uh, Matt from New Zealand said that you can make about 20,000 units of vitamin D with an overall body exposure dose of radiation from the sun in about half the time it takes you to get sunburned. So on that particular day, that Dutch weather forecaster was recommending 10 minutes in the sun to get vitamin D, which it sounds pretty good advice to me. Now, I want to talk today about uh, sequelae. This has been a bit of a concern for some time, actually. Now, we want to talk about, so a sequelae. So, you, you know, like you have the Star Wars movie, then you have the sequel, then you have the sequel on the sequel, then you have the other sequel. So sequelae, uh, the sequelae is the things that come after. So after you have an injury or after you have an illness, there can be long-term complications of that illness. They are the sequelae. And sometimes these things can pop up days later. Sometimes they can be delayed for, for years. So basically in the world at the moment, several billion people are in the process of getting infected with COVID-19 disease. Now we know that many of those will be asymptomatic. We know that the vast majority will have a mild illness, but we also know that some will have a severe illness. And we also know that the virus itself can do damage to tissues and that the inflammatory reaction generated to the virus can do damage to tissues. What we don't know is, is how frequent this is. This is, this is early days on this. And the other thing we don't know is whether the probability of sequelae depends on how severe an episode of disease that you had. So it may be that it transpires that people who have had relatively mild disease can have long-term sequel complications of this. Now, I don't think that's going to be the case. I suspect the sequelae will be more significant in people that have had more severe disease. But there's quite a few things we don't know about this virus, and that's one of them. But I would expect the sequelae are more significant in people that have had more severe disease, but we're going to have to keep an eye on that. But let's have a look at what, what's happening here, because this can, given that a few billion people around the world are getting this infection, this could lead to a large burden of morbidity. So mortality is killing people. Morbidity is, is disease in the community. And if there's long term morbi uh, morbidity, then that's obviously bad for the individuals and it's bad for their families and it's bad for society as a whole. So getting data on this as soon as possible should be a bit of a priority, really. And I've put together some data that we've managed to get already. Now, um, this is on the, the, the sequelae. So lots of references here for you to look at, obviously, all in the uh, comments. Now, we've already noted in previous videos that one in 10 people are sick for three weeks or more. So most people have a mild illness. Most people have a short term illness, but a minority are sick for three weeks or more. And of course, we have heard from people that aren't well for, for months afterwards. It's the minority, but it does happen. So most health sources, most websites you read, most journals you look at, says that people will recover within two weeks. And that's true for most people, but not for everyone, because some people report symptoms from three weeks to three months and the odd case of people reporting symptoms for longer than that. So we know that the course of this illness, the length of this illness, the length of time that people are ill for is quite variable, but thankfully, most commonly, it's relatively short. Now, one concern here is the triggering of diabetes. Now, diabetes is actually a bit of a, a pandemic. There's a huge amount of diabetes around the world. 
And this was this was from uh, from Nature, a science briefing in Nature that talks about this. So at the moment, the journal reports that several anecdotal reports of spontaneous diabetes mellitus type one after COVID-19 infection. Now, when we say diabetes, normally we mean diabetes mellitus and diabetes mellitus is sugar diabetes what people call sugar diabetes. So actually there's two sorts of diabetes. There's one called diabetes mellitus and one called diabetes insipidus. The diabetes insipidus means you produce huge volumes of very dilute urine. Whereas the diabetes mellitus, mellitus means sweet and you produce sweet urine or you did it with it before treatment was available. So diabetes mellitus is the sugar diabetes where the body can't control the amount of sugar and the sugar levels in the blood go up and that has all sorts of complications. And there's two types. There's type one where the body stops producing insulin and there's type two where typically the body responds less well to the insulin that's been produced. And type two is by far and away the most common type. But this looks like there's possibilities here for type one. So what this means is there could be the virus or the inflammatory effects of the virus are actually destroying the insulin producing cells in the body. And these are located in the pancreas and they're called the beta cells. So insulin is produced in what's called the beta cells in the pancreatic islets. And if they're damaged, then people will stop producing insulin. And if they don't produce the insulin, the blood sugar levels will start to rise. So there's evidence of beta cell damage in vitro in, on, on the bench experiments and in small animal studies, small animals, mice actually it was, that have been infected with COVID-19 has been damaged to the, to the beta cells. Now whether this is direct or indirect is unclear. So direct would mean that the virus was attacking the beta cells that make the insulin directly. Indirect damage would be that there are inflammatory processes going on that indirectly damage the beta cells as a result of the inflammatory processes. But whichever one it was, these animals got insulin lack. And uh, what to look out for in humans is we have something called the classic triad of the presentation of diabetes. And this is the classic triad. First thing is weight loss when you're not on a diet. Second thing is undue thirst. And the third thing is polyuria means producing large volumes of urine. So they're the three classic features to look out for. And people also report tiredness, blurred vision, local infections, particularly mouth and vaginal infections, actually, and bladder infections. And ketosis means the breath smells of, uh, of pear drops. It gives the breath a strange smell. So... It's, it, it, so sev where, where are we at with this? Several anecdotal reports, certainly evidence from animals, looking like it's uh, an uncommon, an uncommon event. But actually, we don't know because diabetes type one actually takes when someone gets diabetes type one normally, then it actually takes a year or two for the autoimmune process that is causing the diabetes to kill enough beta cells to cause frank uh, type 1 diabetes. So we're very hopeful that this is going to be uncommon, but at, at the moment we simply don't know. But I would predict there are certainly going to be some people who develop type 1 diabetes as a result of being exposed to COVID-19. Let's just hope it's a very small minority, but at the moment we simply don't have figures on that. But I am sure in my view at the moment, from the information I've got, it's likely there will be some. Let's hope it's a very small uh, amount. So that's the possibility of type 1 diabetes where the body stops producing the essential insulin. Now, the other one that's fairly well documented, the other complication is pulmonary fibrosis. So pulmonary, of course, means to do with the lungs. And fibrosis means the development of scar tissue scar tissue in the lungs and if the scar tissue in the lungs the lungs lose their elasticity and they don't fill with air properly and people can often find it particularly difficult to breathe out because the lungs lose their elasticity and it's also got serious implications for the way that the right side of the heart is able to pump blood through the lungs and can lead on to damage of the uh, the right side of the heart so pulmonary fibrosis, potentially quite a significant disease. Now, pulmonary fibrosis is, is a well-known condition already. 
Um, I'm pretty sure you might remember if you're old enough, there was a motorcycle jumper called Evil Knievel. I think he died of pulmonary fibrosis, I think. But it's, it's, it's not uncommon. We do, we do see it. And it's quite a distressing progressive condition and difficult to, to treat. Um, it tends to progress, uh, unfortunately. So symptoms associated with acute um, COVID-19. Mild upper respiratory tract symptoms to severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. So this is the acute illness. So the virus does seem to get into the body primarily through the lungs. And it can cause mild respiratory tract symptoms to severe uh, a, a respire, to acute respiratory distress syndrome. And as we've looked at many times, this acute respiratory distress syndrome is usually typically caused by the inflammatory reaction to the virus. And this means the alveoli, these all important air sacs fill up with fluid and the oxygen can't get in and the carbon dioxide can't get out as you know well if you've watched these videos before. Now there's data from the uh, from SARS and MERS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome and the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. This was the outbreak in 2002-2003. There was an outbreak of this in 2011, I think. And there still is the occasional outbreak of the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It's a zoonotic syndrome that's normally caught from camels. Uh, it's a very deadly syndrome, but fortunately has low levels of transmissibility. So there's emerging data. F so th there is data already known from these conditions that pulmonary fibrosis can be a complication of infection with severe acute respiratory syndrome and Middle East respiratory syndrome. That is a recognized uh, sequelae, this long term damage to the lungs. And there's emerging data from the current COVID-19 pandemic now to add to this. And of course, these are the two pathological, severely pathological coronaviruses that are already known about. This is another coronavirus. So really, it wouldn't be surprising if they had similar effects. Could be substantial fibrotic consequences following the SARS coronavirus 2 infections, according to this uh, article in the, uh, in the Lancet. So the, the medical journals here are certainly acknowledging this, this, this possibility stroke probability. Again, we would expect it to affect a minority, but because billions of people are getting infected, this could potentially transpose into thousands, tens of thousands, or even millions of cases globally. It could be an issue. So it could be substantial fibrotic consequences following SARS coronavirus 2 infection, which of course is causing the COVID pandemic. Now there is a condition called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And what happens here is people tend to develop this um, pulmonary fibrosis. Their lungs become all scarred and inelastic. And very often it's difficult to say what the cause was, but the cause could have been a virus that the person had contracted in the past. There's other possible theories of etiology there, but that's one possibility. Now, we do have antifibrotic therapies and they've got a possible role in treatment. Now, this is interesting. People that, so th th these drugs that reduce the formation of fibrosis in the lungs, they don't stop it. They just slow it down. Now, there's some intimation that these antifibrotic therapies might have a role in treating acute COVID-19 respiratory complications, but no trial data on that that I'm aware of. But the antifibrotic therapies might have a role in preventing fibrosis after SARS coronavirus 2 infections. And some tentative studies at the moment are showing that maybe 20 to 30% of people who have severe disease could develop longer term pulmonary uh, complications. So that's another one that could increase the, uh, the burden of morbidity uh, in the future. Let's hope it's a small minority. Let's hope the 20 or 30% of people who had severe COVID-19 infections and are still suffering from these consequences, let's hope they resolve. But once the scar tissue is there, the scar tissue will not resolve. Once the scar tissue is established, the lungs can no longer replace it with healthy blood vessels, lymphatics, small airways and alveolar air sacs. Once they are destroyed, once the basement membrane of those is destroyed, once the overall architecture of those is destroyed, they cannot recover. Now, another group of sequelae is uh, neurology, neurological features. Now, there is kind of a precedent for this. In, in 1917, there, there was um, an outbreak of a, a virus that affected the brain called encephalitis lethargica. 
And I, I can remember when I was a, when I was a first year student nurse, old doctors talking about this post encephalitic Parkinsonism. They, they used to talk about so so they were people that were still alive then. That was what sixty years after, uh, sixty uh, fifty five sixty years after the infection. Um, so there there is precedent for this. Um, this call what we call this used to call cause post encephalitic. So N means inside. Kef is the brain. So post encephalitic is is after there's been inflammation in the brain. The virus went into the brain in 1917 and caused these long term Parkinson effects. And Parkinsonism, as you probably know, is characterised by rigidity, slow movements, and of course the uh, the tremor that's so characteristic of Parkinson's disease. So what do we know? Well, from from, the, from this article here, um, around a third of ITU patients admitted for respiratory difficulties respiratory difficulties exhibit neurological symptoms so about a third of patients admitted to intensive care for respiratory difficulties have neurological symptoms now in a sense this isn't surprising so if someone's in intensive care for breathing difficulties difficulties then the levels of oxygen in their blood can be low they can be hypoxic and that can reduce the amount of oxygen getting to the brain. And as you probably know, lack of oxygen, the brain is very dependent on a constant supply of oxygen. And if the brain is hypoxic for any period of time, that can result in brain damage. So it could be that there's some neurological features here, which are a complication of the hypoxia caused by the respiratory failure. Or it could be that there's inflammatory changes and all these inflammatory cytokines that are floating around in the blood as a result of the body's immunological response to the presence of the virus, that these inflammatory, pro-inflammatory cytokines could be damaging the brain. That's another, that's another possibility. But this, this article clearly says that uh, SARS coronavirus 2 dissemination into the brain parenchyma is possible. Now, parenchyma, again, this is just an uh, anatomical description. Parenchyma means in the, in the structure of the organ. So, so if you get a brain and you cut it in half, you're cutting through the parenchyma. It's the same with any organ. The parenchyma means the tissue that it's made of. So it's quite possible, and it's looking possible, that in some cases, uh, that the SARS coronavirus 2 can actually get into the brain and then potentially cause damage. So uh, coronavirus infection can potentially lead to chronic neuroinflammation. So neuro, that's to do with the, the neurons. In this case, we're talking about the central nervous system, the brain. Uh, that can lead to inflammation in the nervous tissue. And that can also lead to progressive demyelination. Now, again, a bit technical here, but the, the myelin sheath is the insulation around about a nerve fiber so if that's a nerve fiber there my pen's a nerve fiber then that nerve fiber is not on its own because you would get short circuits because it's electrical so what you have round about it just like my hand there you have a myelin sheath that protects it and, and stops the insulation uh, keeps it electrically insulated and feeds a new, t new n n nourishes the neuron the nerve fiber as well but in demyelination this myelin sheath in this case, my hand to generate some were left with a nerve fibre on its own, which of course doesn't work properly. So that's called demyelination. So there's this p potential risk of demyelination. And demyelination is exactly what happens in multiple sclerosis. So, so <clears throat> we've got a possibility of multiple sclerosis type presentation here <clears throat> that's possible. And this can lead to sensory motor dysfunctions. Again, this is, this is medical terminology, but sensory means to do with sensation, what you feel. Motor is movement, the ability to move. So the way you, you feel the body could be changed and the way that you're able to move the body could be changed. There can also be psychiatric disorders and uh, brain cell uh, degeneration and demyelination, damage to the brain cells themselves and damage to this myelin this myelin sheath also now there's less data i found on this but another possibility i haven't mentioned here is cardiac damage now we know that this can occur because right from the early stages as we've said before we have we have the cells in the heart muscle the myocytes these contractile cells and they're supposed to have this membrane round about them but when the cell dies this membrane is disrupted 
So the membrane basically has holes in it. There will be gaps in it. And there's, there's contractile components inside this cell that allow it to contract because the heart's a muscle, of course. And one of these is called troponin. And if the cell wall is damaged, the troponins can leak out into the blood. And you get troponins in the blood. So the troponins are supposed to be in the heart muscle cells, in the myocardial cells. But if these myocardial cells are damaged, the troponins leak out. And the higher the levels of troponins that we find in the blood, that means the more damage and leakage uh, there has been. And we know that in some patients, troponins are damaged. So we know there's a possibility for damage of this heart muscle, the myocardium, in some patients potentially. And again, this could lead on to things like heart failure. But um, limited data on that at the moment, but it is possible. So what we're saying here is that there is the possibility that we're going to get more cases of diabetes, more chronic lung disease, uh, more neurological disorders, even potentially psychiatric disorders, and potentially more uh, cardiac disorders. That could be long term and could be with us uh, causing problems years and decades into the future. The numbers yet we don't know. Let's hope that they are low. But uh, more to come on that. What I would suspect is that most people are going to carry on getting mild or asymptomatic disease. A minority will get some more severe disease. I think it much more probable that the people who get the more severe disease are likely to suffer the sequelae. And I'm hoping that while some people, one in 10, is going to take them weeks or months to recover from this infection, I would hope that they would recover. So like three or four months later, they're going to be back to complete normal health again. But unfortunately, I do fear there will be a minority who do develop long-term lung disease, brain disease, heart disease, and potentially diabetes mellitus type 1. Let's just hope the numbers are small, but we don't know yet, but the potential is certainly there, unfortunately. Now, <clears throat> let's show you some... Oh, no, this is interesting. So, um, <clears throat> Joe, Joe was sent um, a test kit. And you can't see it. There you go. Yeah, we sent a test kit. For um, antibody testing at home. In the UK to gauge the extent of the spread of the virus in uh, amongst the public. And you get sent this nice book here. Now, this is um, Joe's result that is kindly taken uh, a picture of for us. Now, what we have here is this is the diagnostic strip. And by the way, we need, we need a few billion of these. Let's hope we get a lot of them really soon. So it's a bit like, it reminds me of a pregnancy test. We use all these all the time on A&E. Not for blood, that, that, the test you have in for that. So, so what you have here is um, you put a drop of blood in there. So just a finger prick test, finger prick drop of blood in there. And then that, 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 that blood migrates up through this paper like this. And, and um, if it gets, to, if it gets to, um, to this level, that level there indicates there's immunoglobulin type M's, IgM. Now, the IgM's are the type of antibody that develop early, so they seem to have gone. But we notice that Joe has got a line there for IgG, immunoglobulin type G, the antibody. The antibody is called immunoglobulin type G, so he's had that. So this is a positive result. So Joe has had COVID-19. Now, because the IgM are the more acute antibodies, the more acute immunoglobulins that would be there in the first days and weeks of the illness, they seem to have uh, gone. But the IgG has persisted. Now, this has got two remarkably important implications in my mind. Oh, just before I talk, talk about that, that top one, there's the control. That's just to make sure that this piece of strippy stuff is working properly so you've got a good control line meaning it's working but you've got the igg there that's uh, that's positive and the igm the acute ones are gone so what this means to me is that joe had this infection a few weeks ago because or even a few months ago because he no longer has the uh, igm but he still has the igg but he has the igg he has it and this is the immunological molecule that confers 
protection, at least I believe, confers protection against the disease and he has it. So there's the evidence that there is um, IgG still present in the blood sometime after the infection. And I believe that will confer a good level of immunity. So we know that this antibody is there after a period of time. And uh, therefore, I believe, is, is conferring immunity. And, and indeed, that there's quite a lot of evidence now that people who have this uh, immunoglobulin are immune to the disease for a period of time. How long? We don't know. Could be a year, could be two years. We, we, we simply don't know. Could be months. Let's hope it's more than months. But thank you for sending that in, Joe. So that's remarkably good. So basically, um, we need a few billion of these. And I'm looking forward to doing mine because everyone's going to have to do one of these to find out if they've had the disease at some stage. But this is a pilot study. And this is sent out to a random sample across the UK. So good data can be derived from that. Because if you send out to a random sample, then it's, it's logical to extrapolate up to the whole population from that information. Now, just have a few of you people now. Let's see. These are the important people. Without you, there would be no point. <laughs> uh, Nigel and uh, Tyrion in Lancashire. Just down the road from me. Vitamin D. Might not be necessary today because it's really nice and sunny in this part of the world. But um, the principle is excellent. And you're both wearing very high quality masks by the look of practicing for going out. So thank you for sending that down the M6 in Lancaster, Lancashire. Uh, this is Paul who is in Illinois in the States. Thank you for watching, Paul. Great to know people are watching in the States. Uh, what do I want? That's it. Uh, this uh, car is demonstrating the importance of wearing masks, which is good. That's in Philadelphia. Not quite sure who sent that in, but thank you, whoever it was. <laughs> uh, this is uh, New Hampshire. This is the gardener's market in New Hampshire. So fairly good social distancing there. Pleased to see that in New Hampshire. As indeed was at my own local supermarket, which I showed you the video of uh, a few days ago. Excellent uh, social distancing. But glad to see that's happening in uh, up there in New England. Uh, this is Ron, who watches in Thailand. Plenty of sun in Thailand, but uh, anyway, good to see you watching, Ron, in Thailand. Thank you for that. Quite a few viewers in Thailand, actually. It's, uh, it's good to know. Uh, this is uh, Salam, who watches in Iran. So really good to know people are watching over there in, in the great country of Iran. Very sophisticated country. I've met some very clever doctors from Iran, I must say. And, and uh, uh, I ran an adaptation program a few years ago for nurses who qualified um, overseas. And we had some students there from Iran. And very good uh, nurses they were too. And adapted to English ways really quite quickly. It was a pleasure to have them. Uh, this is Tara and Lucy from Cairns, Australia. I seem to be quite popular amongst cats. Uh, this is Tyler in Hawaii. I'm not quite sure what the significance of this puppet is, but I expect Tyler knows. And while we're on the topic of cats, let's have a look at one last thing. There's some Veronica's cat <laughs> watching me. Very studious cat. <laughs> Yep, I seem to be popular with cats. There you go. Still watching. Okay, thank you for watching this video. That's all for today.